There's an engineering concept that applies here. The best part is no part. The best process is no process. And that concept was drilled into me during my medical school and training as a junior doctor, that sometimes the best test is no test and the best treatment is to avoid an unnecessary one. But that's not the approach that many longevity clinics, which are springing up everywhere, take. So instead, they offer an ever-growing list of tests to assess your health. And behind it all, the logic, it feels compelling, right? So the more information that we gather, the better our health outcomes can be. We'll spot all of the problems and be able to fix them before they get worse. But the picture is quite different in reality. So more testing and more information can often lead to worse health outcomes. And when I tell my patients this, most of them are skeptical. So I tell them about South Korea. So something alarming happened in South Korea after 1999. So the number of people diagnosed with thyroid cancer exploded. And in 1999, there were 6.3 cases per 100,000 people in the population. But by 2009, that number had ballooned to nearly 48. That's more than seven times as much. Now, this raises an obvious question. What is going on that suddenly caused so much thyroid cancer? Well, the answer isn't what you might expect. So after careful examination of the data, researchers figured out that what was driving the surge, and it actually didn't look like more people were getting thyroid cancer. Instead, doctors were just finding more cases that had been there all along. So why was this? Well, a government-funded cancer screening initiative led to the widespread use of ultrasounds to screen for thyroid cancer. So, okay, there wasn't something environmental that was going on to drive up these cancer rates, so that's a relief. But this greater rate of detection, that's still a win, right? Because we always hear that catching cancer early is key to effective treatment. So this aggressive cancer screening program that should have led to much better outcomes in terms of quality and mortality of life, surely, when it comes to thyroid cancer. But it didn't. Mortality rates in South Korea for thyroid cancer, they remained about the same. So in other words, we haven't seen better health outcomes related to thyroid cancer, despite aggressive cancer screening programs to catch many of these cases. So someone might think at this point, well, what's the loss? Surely it's better safe than sorry to find the thyroid cancer and deal with it. Well, have a look at this chart. It shows that the number of patients who had surgery for thyroid cancer, and by 2012, that number was around 11,000. But in 2001, it was only about 1,000. But again, there was no noticeable impact on mortality. So these surgeries were not saving lives. They were totally unnecessary. And what probably happened was that many of these cancers were so slow growing that they were never going to cause an issue during that person's lifetime. So in those instances, there was no benefit but there were harms. So during thyroid surgery, the laryngeal nerve can be accidentally cut, causing issues with speech and swallowing. There's also infection risks and bleeding risks. So clearly there's a loss. But this isn't just about South Korea. It's a cautionary tale about how healthcare doesn't always lead to better health outcomes. And in the latest longevity clinic fads seem to be missing this point. So consider full body MRI scans, for instance. So these are rising dramatically in popularity. And again, the logic sounds right. And as one provider puts it, you can catch conditions before they come a crisis. So it's true that you might catch the presence of dangerous cancers, but there's also a high chance that you'll catch something else. So when patients get high precision scans like CT scans and MRI scans, these instruments, they often uncover many unexpected things. So these are called incidental findings when they aren't related to the reason for the scan. So for instance, if a person is having heart issues, they might undergo a scan for calcium in their blood vessel walls. But in the images, the doctor may notice a mass in the patient's lung. So these incidental findings are incredibly common. They show up in about 20 to 40% of CT scans or MRI scans. So if a patient doesn't have symptoms and is getting a scan for preventative measures, everything that is found will be incidental. But the thing to notice here is how common it is that scans will reveal something and will detect something. But here's the issue. What should we do about all of these incidental omas? So in practice, what often happens is further exploration. So the initial finding triggers what's been called a cascade of care. So this is when physicians launch into a series of expensive additional tests and procedures, which can then themselves trigger even more tests and more procedures. So most of the time, these incidental findings, they turn out to be benign, as in they were so slow growing or weren't going to cause any issues. So for instance, one study looked at nodules in the lung that were incidental findings in patients being scanned for plaque in their arteries. So in a group of 479 people, the scan found small growths in the lungs of 81 or 18% of the study population. Now, none of those growths turned out to be cancerous, but some people needed to undergo additional tests, including biopsies, to figure out exactly what was going on. And with biopsies, there's always the risk of infection, of bleeding, of cutting something that you shouldn't. 
In other words, many of us have abnormalities that we aren't aware of and don't actually need anything to be done about them. They will either go away with time or they won't ever cause us issues. So coming back to full body MRI scans, yes, sometimes we will catch a cancerous growth, but here's the completely counterintuitive part that was illustrated in the story about South Korea. So it's often the case that cancers are so slow growing that they're never going to do harm if just left alone. So we get no benefit from discovering it. So for those reasons, the logic behind full body MRI scans is completely flawed. The intent is to prevent harm through early diagnosis, but in many cases, the opposite happens. There's increased harm and no benefit. And that's why expert bodies like the American College of Radiology do not endorse it for asymptomatic patients without obvious risk factors or a relevant family history. So in a statement published in 2003, they said, To date, there is no documented evidence that total body screening is cost-effective or effective in prolonging life. In addition, the ACR is concerned that such procedures will lead to the identification of numerous non-specific findings that will not ultimately improve a patient's health, but will result in unnecessary follow-up testing and procedures as well as significant expense. And many of us might think, well, can't we just do the scan and ignore the things that are likely to be nothing? Well, imagine your doctor telling you, we found an unusual lump on your pancreas, but not to worry, the odds are very high that it's nothing. For most of us, the unknown can be incredibly difficult to cope with, and many of us want to find out what that lump actually is through further imaging and biopsies. And even if there's a one in a million chance that that isn't a problem, again, most of us will want to go on with that cascade of care. And it's not just imaging that's a problem, so we can see similar issues with other diagnostic services offered through longevity clinics. So one provider offers a slate of over 160 lab tests, many of which are based on a blood sample. Now, some of these are clinically meaningful and important to check, like LDL cholesterol levels, but for many of them, the test results are completely meaningless, and it's just marketing spin to get you to pay extra. So there are two more examples that I want to share with you, and the first is around prostate cancer. So it's incredibly common, but a lot of men, even though they do have prostate cancer, will never get symptoms from it and they'll never have issues. And without screening for it, they'd never know that they have the disease. It's similar to the thyroid story from South Korea. If cancer is diagnosed though, there are various treatment strategies possible, but the treatments can carry significant problems like erectile dysfunction and incontinence. So even a biopsy has significant adverse effects and a slightly elevated risk of death. Now obviously, sometimes treatment is necessary and it can save lives, but often biopsies and treatments are carried out in cases where there would often be no problems whatsoever. So on balance, the US Preventative Services Task Force concluded that there's only a small potential benefit for regular screening for men aged between 55 to 69, and there's substantial risks for harm. So I always have to deal with this in the clinic. We have to discuss with our patients and make sure that they do want to be screened and that the benefits of that screening program are going to vastly outweigh the risks, and we have to individualize that care to the person sitting in front of me. And one final example highlights the risk of wasting money on unproven fixes to unproven problems that may give us no benefit. So for instance, there's an emerging trend to have microplastics filtered out of your blood. So one clinic in London will do the procedure for a mere £10,000. But scientists aren't yet sure about the effects that microplastics have in our blood. So what I mean by this is what level do they start to become a problem? So all of us might actually be fine with our current levels, or we should be shooting for a particular number. But again, we don't have the research yet. We don't know whether we should be worried about this or not. And when it comes to these procedures, we certainly don't know that the procedure will actually fix our microplastic levels, particularly when the procedures involve plastic tubing, which they themselves are a hive of microplastics. And I want to highlight all of this because so many people are spending bucket loads of money on their health and they're actually getting worse health outcomes. And not only worse health outcomes, they are harming their wallet. So do all of these risks mean that we shouldn't get screened at all? Well, what is the right approach to card our health without exposing ourselves to unnecessary harm and unnecessary costs? Well, a starting point is to recognize that we can go wrong in either of two directions. So there absolutely can be too much healthcare where we're screening aggressively when we lack symptoms of a problem, but there can also be too little healthcare. So this would be true for cases where screening has greater benefits than the risks, but we fail to do it. So many of us get that logic of too little healthcare, but the logic of getting too much healthcare is much harder to see. And unless you've looked at the examples like thyroid cancer in South Korea, it's difficult to grasp that sometimes the best test is no test and the best treatment is to avoid an unnecessary one.
But now that I've made that argument clear, where do we go? What is the best way to balance the risks and the harms from screening programs? How do we take an evidence-based approach? Well, the most common types of screening are carefully studied. We've got a great idea about what can produce better health outcomes and what's unlikely to. So expert bodies that study the existing evidence provide guidelines that give us a good starting point to make these decisions. So for instance, the American Cancer Society publishes recommendations about screening for cancer. So screenings for breast cancer, colorectal cancer, cervical cancer, lung cancer, they're all recommended for certain populations. And your doctor is almost certainly going to recommend checking for blood tests like LZ L cholesterol and ApoB. That's because these are linked to heart disease by tons of evidence and they're highly actionable. So if our levels are elevated, we can take steps to change this. And if the screening programs are not based on sound data, we should be incredibly skeptical about looking for problems when we aren't experiencing any symptoms. That's when we run into the greatest risk for leaving our health and our wallets worse off. And finally, we should focus our attention on things that we already know move the needle when it comes to our health, so we can make a huge difference to our risks for top killers like heart disease through diet and exercise. And I mentioned a moment ago that there are some blood tests that are definitely worth getting, and I strongly recommend to my patients that they get five in particular. So make sure to check out this next video here to find out what those five are and why they are so important.